Hey everybody, thanks for coming. So I'm here uh, to talk about test flakiness, everybody's favorite subject. So we're gonna talk about uh, methods for identifying and dealing with flaky tests. Before we do that, I just wanna give a quick shout out to Ryan Marsh for making me this gift last night. <laughs> this is phenomenal, he is great. So who am I? I am Jason Palmer, uh, I've been at Spotify for eight years, mostly as an engineer. Um, I'm currently the PM of a web infrastructure team and a test infrastructure team. Uh, Toast Infra is actually their name. I'm very proud of them. Uh, I'm also part of the Jest core team and I wrote the Jest JUnit reporter. So if you use Jest in a CI environment, there's a pretty good chance you're using that. Um, and for the past four years at Spotify, I've worked on building various systems that helped us eliminate test flakiness. And so this talk is more or less me talking about that journey and things that we've built and things that we've learned along the way. Cool, so let's start off by learning what test flakiness is. I feel like we've had a few talks mention it today, but let's just make sure everybody knows. So the best way that I know to teach you what test flakiness is, is from a tweet. This is hands down the best definition of test flakiness that I have ever seen. And you should all follow John on Twitter. So what he says, I'm gonna read the tweet out. He says, has anyone ever worked on a code base with a test suite that didn't sometimes throw a weird error that your entire team just agreed to ignore? Asking for a friend. How many people here have had a test suite like this? Yeah, a couple of liars in the room. <laughs> I see you. So this is the formal definition, one of the formal definitions that I like. This comes from Google. So they say that a test is flaky if it exhibits both a passing and a failing result with the same code, which makes sense. Sometimes the test passes, sometimes it fails, same exact code. So let's talk quickly about the cost of flakiness. Uh, flaky tests are definitely annoying, but they are also costly. Uh, they can really hurt your business and have a massive effect on productivity. They obviously cost money. Uh, you may not be aware of that, I suppose. They cost a lot of money if you have a huge engineering team like Spotify or Shopify. Uh, just imagine like a complex system that takes 40 minutes to build and test on CI. Uh, and then imagine having to re-trigger pull requests 10% uh, of the time. Uh, so this can quickly add up and cause a lot of grief. Uh, things like this can easily result in entire days of productivity loss. But this isn't even the worst cost. This I think is the worst cost. The loss of confidence. So we've been talking about this all day and I, I really wanna hit this home. So the real cost of test flakiness over time is the loss of confidence in your tests. So confidence in your code, confidence that it does exactly what it's supposed to do is the key thing that allows us to continuously deliver value to our users and that is the end goal here. That's why we're all here at this conference, that's why we write tests to begin with so flaky tests cause us to lose confidence in our test suite and then we either resort to manual testing or no testing at all, which is a horrible thing to happen. All right, so now you know what test flakiness is. We're all on the same page here. I wanna talk briefly about my experience with test flakiness at Spotify. So in 2016, I joined a new team uh, called NYC Infra. It was the first infrastructure team in New York, hence the name. Uh, it's still a team, so if you join Spotify, you can join that team. Um, I was pretty excited to join this team. I've sort of always gravitated towards wanting to build tools for developers and build tools to help developers be more efficient. That just is very gratifying to me, even to this day. Um, and this team was asked to solve a pretty big problem. Um, we were asked to solve, to, to basically reduce the time that it takes to get code changes merged for all of these clients, the iOS client, Android, and the desktop client. So no big deal, right? Um, and for those not aware, our desktop client is basically a big web app. 
Um, so with this problem in mind, actually our initial focus was on build times. It wasn't on test flakiness. So um, I didn't join this team really knowing anything about testing or test flakiness. Um, everything that I sort of know about testing and test flakiness now, I just learned mostly from being on this team actually. Um, so we spent a lot of time kind of building systems to measure how long builds take in CI and how long they take locally. Uh, and then kind of working on trying to make builds faster for our main clients. Um, and yeah, during this time I actually wrote a, an NPM client that I called Ziploc internally. Um, and uh, I planned on open sourcing it, but then shortly after NPM and Yarn came out with lock file support and it was like way better than what I wrote. So um, anyways, it's a fun project. <clears throat> But developers were still unhappy. So we had improved build times. I can't remember the exact number, but something like 20 or 30%. We had to improve the build times. But PRs were still failing. People would submit pull requests to these systems and they would just fail randomly. And so we quickly realized that we needed to focus on why these builds were failing. Um, so let's take a look at like a typical developer workflow from that time. And this would apply to anybody that deals with flaky tests kind of at scale. So we start with a happy developer that submits a pull request. They've just spent a lot of time coding up a new feature and they're ready to submit a pull request. So they go ahead and do that. Now CI runs your build, everything is good. Except it's not good, this test fails. Uh, and the developer is confused because this test has nothing to do with their code change. Everything should be fine, what's going on here? So the developer investigates the failure, decides uh, they should just re-trigger the build because the tests pass locally. So it can't be a problem with my code, right? Except the build fails again. <laughs> but this time it's a different test. It's interesting. Uh, the developer is now crying. It's very sad. And so we re-trigger the build again. This time, I mean, what else are we gonna do here? So we just hope that the build eventually passes. And then finally, yes, the build is green. We can merge. <laughs> so now imagine that each time we did this, that it took 40 minutes at least to get you know, one of these builds to finish. You can imagine easily the last few slides taking like an entire day of your time. And at the end of the day, this is that same developer Sad, sad, sad. <laughs> so uh, what I wanna talk about is the um, most common causes of test flakiness that I've seen. Uh, so this is just from my perspective. These are things that I've seen personally at Spotify. There are lots of causes of test flakiness, a lot of which have been talked about today. Um, but I wanna talk about some of the things that I've seen that are super common and then how to fix them. But I wanna start by uh, showing a flaky test that I wrote. So I wanna start with that. Can anybody tell me why this test might be flaky? Are you all able to read this? Why is this test flaky? Just shout it out, shout it out. What do you guys think? There's no what? Uh huh. Okay, you're all wrong, but it's, <laughs> anyways, that's kind of the point. The point that I wanted to make by showing you this is, is really twofold. One, the main point is that it's really difficult to just look at a test or to kind of grep uh, a given code base and sort of um, see test flakiness, right? Uh, this is just something you kind of experience on CI at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, I also wanted to let you know that like I'm not immune to this. Um, so even though uh, I'm gonna be talking to you about test flakiness, I still write flaky tests, uh, so I'm not immune to this. And yeah, the, the main reason why this is a flaky test here is that this is effectively an end-to-end -end test. So this is completely reliant on uh, other people's systems and network requests to actually complete, right? End-to-end -end tests are sort of flaky by nature. We're gonna talk about that later. Cool, so the first uh, cause of flakiness that I wanna talk about is inconsistent assertion timing. Um, so basically, if you 
uh, have a test with like an expect statement or an assert statement, you wanna make sure that the app is in the exact same state, a very consistent state when you're asserting on these things. Uh, otherwise, you can kind of uh, have this issue. So here's an example. Um, all of the code that I'm gonna show in these examples here are kind of made up code. But uh, here's an example here, this is a fake app. And you can see that we're logging in, we're loading an app, uh, and then we just have an expect statement. We're expecting 15 profiles uh, to be written to the DOM. So the problem with this that you may run into, this, this code might work perfectly, but what you might run into is that expect statement right there uh, may be happening at the wrong time. So you could have some asynchronous fetching and the profiles may not all be there yet. Uh, and so typically like, you have to understand that tests tend to run faster than users clicking around in your browser uh, to use your app. And so how do you fix this? So here we've add, added a couple of things. Um, this is using Jest, by the way. So one thing that we added was async so that we can turn this into an async await test. Uh, and then we've added a DOM testing library here to basically wait until the app gets into an appropriate state. So this is kind of uh, you know, a fake example here. But if you use Cypress, if you use React testing library, or kind of any other modern framework, you're gonna see um, methods like this. And this is a really common pattern for you to follow, follow for uh, asynchronous testing. The uh, next cause of flakiness that I wanna talk about is reliance on test order. Um, this was surprisingly common, and uh, I was really surprised by that. So sometimes you'll see that tests won't pass if you just run them in isolation. If you just run one particular test, it's gonna fail. You run the entire suite, everything is fine. Uh, or if you decide to skip a test and then another test ends up failing because of that, both of these situations, this is reliance on test order. And so here's another kind of made up example to show uh, this happening. So we got this first test here that is expecting count, which is effectively kind of representing global state here or shared state between these two tests. So we have uh, expect count to be zero, and then at some point it's incrementing count. And the next test is now reliant on that state change. And so now it, they, this next test has to say expect count to be one. So if we were to skip that first test or delete that first test or only run the second one, um, that test will never pass. And so how do you fix this? Pretty much um, you have to reset state in between each test. Um, or not rely on global state, that's another thing, but like, we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole. Um, but pretty much this is what you wanna do anyways. This is a good model to follow. So we added a before each here, and then we reset the count to zero. Uh, and so a, a kind of more real world example of this would be a test that is sort of writing to a database or a test that is you know, modifying user state or some kind of higher level component in React or something like this. You wanna make sure that the state is exactly the same for each test. Um, and that other tests don't modify that state. So the final um, reason for test flakiness that I'm gonna talk about is my personal favorite, is end-to-end -end tests. Uh, there's been a few mentions of it today and I'm really happy about that. Um, so end-to-end -end tests I mentioned earlier are kind of flaky by nature. And here's that same example from before. This is the flaky test that I wrote, which is an end-to-end -end test. And so what's the solution to this? How do you actually fix flakiness in an end-to-end -end test? Pretty much, um, don't write them. Uh, but, uh, or no, write, write less of them. It's fine to write them. Um, what you see here is uh, Kent Dodd's testing trophy, which is, if you're familiar with like any kind of testing pyramids, you probably all are. This one is my personal favorite, uh, but there's others. You might be more familiar with this one. This is like the more traditional testing pyramid. But what's in common between both of these is that end-to-end -end tests are at the top. Uh, and there's kind of a reason for that. I think the last talk mentioned it quite well better than I am, but um, what you sort of see is that at the, at the very bottom of either of these pyramids, uh, you have a lot of tests and these tend to be very quick, they tend to be very stable, and as you kind of go up the pyramid, they get uh, slower and they get less stable. And so you're supposed to sort of have less of them. 
And just to be clear, if you're writing tests in Cypress or if you're writing tests in Puppeteer or Selenium, there's a pretty high likelihood that's an end-to-end -end test. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with using those. I'm not saying you shouldn't use them. Use them. They're fucking awesome. Uh, but um, what I would recommend is have like five instead of 500 tests. And just understand that those five tests will be slower and they will be occasionally flaky. But they are quite useful to have. So don't like not write them. And because I'm telling you not to write tests at a testing conference, I, I thought I would sort of extend an olive branch here. This is something that uh, my test infra team worked on recently. Uh, and um, I want to tell you about it. I think it would sort of help you with your flaky end-to-end -end tests. So we created a jest preset for poly, which can help you kind of turn your end-to-end -end tests into more stable deterministic integration tests. Uh, the Cypress auto recorder that was mentioned in the last talk uh, kind of threw me for a loop because these are very similar ideas here. Both are VCR testing. And uh, so Poly, if you're not familiar, Poly is a great tool built by Netflix that helps you write VCR tests. And I'll briefly explain what VCR is. But uh, so it's basically if you have a test that makes network requests and you're using some VCR technology, then uh, any network requests that are made during the test run are recorded and stored to files. You, know, you commit those files next to your code, and then when your tests run on CI, instead of it going out to the network to actually satisfy those network requests, it satisfies them by those files. So it turns your tests into more deterministic tests, more stable, faster. So give this a shot, and uh, let me know what you think. Cool, so uh, I want to talk about some of the systems that we built in order to tackle flakiness at Spotify. One such system. Uh, so this is like a super zoomed in screenshot. Unfortunately, I can't show you the entire UI for reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, this kind of drives home one major point that I want to make, which is simply showing developers uh, that their test is flaky has an impact. So just highlighting it and showing it in a dumb table like this has made an impact. Uh, when we first measured flakiness at Spotify and sort of built this entire data set, uh, flakiness levels were at like, I think six or seven percent, something like that. I can't remember the exact number. It went down by two to three percent within two months. And we're talking about a humongous engineering organization with lots and lots and lots of systems. So this is what I kind of wanted to drive home, even though I couldn't show you the whole UI, is that simply building a system that shows people uh, what tests are flaky has an impact. And you can see this particular system isn't flaky at all, which is awesome. We have this other tool, which I, I think is a, a pretty cool way to visualize test flakiness. So this is a system internally that we call Odin I. And um, I cut off, on the, on the left-hand side, you would typically see, uh, going vertically, you would see the individual class names uh, for tests. Uh, I cut that off so that I'm not like naming and shaming people. Um, but yeah, this is a system that we call Odin I. And on the left-hand side vertically, you'll see individual tests. Uh, on the top there, uh, you see individual CI builds, right? And so what you see here is a pretty good test suite. Uh, this is 100% stable. Uh, all of these green dots mean that there was a pass for this given test on this given CI run. And these uh, purple ones here mean that those tests were skipped. So let me show you what, a flake, what flakiness actually looks like in this view. This is what flakiness looks like. Uh, and the reason why I quite like this uh, visualization here is that it's really easy for you to kind of differentiate between flakiness and infrastructure problems. Um, and I would highly recommend that you all kind of build something like this because it's super useful. So you can kind of see an example of flakiness would be like this top right corner here, right? Where you sort of see like a sprinkling of uh, test failures. But where you see an entire kind of column or a large portion of tests in a given build fail, you can kind of assume, uh, I mean, it may be a flakiness problem, but you can kind of assume if a large amount of tests are failing in one given build, maybe the network is down, maybe the CI machine is fucked or something. Uh, it's probably not a flaky test. Um, and that's why I quite like this visualization. So we also, so after we kind of uh, provided developers with tools like this to let them know what tests of theirs are flaky, um, 
one thing that uh, we got a lot of feedback on is like, well, how do I know that I fixed the flakiness problem, right? So we could tell developers all day long that their tests are flaky, uh, but there isn't always like an obvious fix for how to address that. Um, and it would be really good to know ahead of time before you merge code into master that your code isn't flaky. So we built FlakyBot for this exact reason. So FlakyBot's a tool that we have that enables engineers to exercise their tests uh, to see if they're flaky before merging code into master. And uh, you can kind of see an example of this. So we use uh, GitHub, GitHub Enterprise at Spotify. And if you wanted to exercise a given test or a given collection of tests, you just invoke FlakyBot like this. You write a comment saying, FlakyBot, run my tests 100 times. And it gives you back the results and tells you if it's flaky or not, which is pretty cool. And the final system that we kind of have in place, this is like a relatively new thing. And I didn't work on this, so I'm not going to take credit for any of this part. But this is like super cool. Um, we have a system in place called the Master Guardian. So this is an entirely automated workflow. And uh, basically, it uses the same data set that we talked about before um, to detect flaky tests. Then what it will do is automatically create JIRA tickets for the owners of those flaky tests, notifying them that they kind of, that their stuff's flaky. Uh, and then it sends them a message on Slack as sort of like a further notification. Um, and uh, yeah, it will try to like re, retry the tests uh, pre-merge, but basically the point in this is that it will ignore flaky tests pre-merge. That may sound like a bad idea, and let me clarify, there are certain tests that you're simply not allowed to ignore, even if they are flaky, so we do have that concept in mind. Uh, but if you have hundreds of developers that are working on any given system, it's a good idea to push flaky tests off to the side. They are not useful. Cool, so these are all extremely useful systems. These have saved us tons of time and tons of money at Spotify. Um, and yeah, I wanna show you guys how to build this. Um, I'd like you all to leave here as like super engineers, go back to your company and build some really impactful tools. So I'm gonna show you how to do it. So the first thing you're gonna need is a bunch of XML files. Why is everybody leaving? I'm kidding. Uh, so yeah, you have to start with uh, junit.xml files. Um, I wrote a little utility um, a while ago when I was working on this problem on Spotify desktop, uh, just junit, and so feel free to use that if you're using jest, uh, but pretty much any test runner can make these files, and all a junit.xml file is is pretty much this. I hope that this is readable, uh, but this is like a really, really simple example it tells you what tests pass, what tests failed, how long they took to run. Basically everything that you see in that table that I initially showed before. And so with this information, uh, you can kind of use this as your data source. So take all of the data from these junit.xml files, put them into a database or something more advanced. So, and then you wanna choose uh, a flakiness detection technique. There's a couple of different ways to sort of detect if a test is flaky. Um, all have sort of pros and cons, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of them, and you could choose which one is right for you. So this is kind of the most accurate method that I'm aware of. Um, what you might do if you use this method, if you wanted to like establish a baseline, figure out what tests are currently flaky, each individual test, you run that test 50 to 100 times uh, in the same environment, in a CI environment. Moving forward, like once you establish the baseline, uh, every single time you have a commit to master, run every single test 50 to 100 times in isolation to be able to figure out if those tests are still flaky and exactly how flaky they are. And so the flakiness percentage is failed uh, runs divided by uh, the total number of runs. So this is the most accurate method of determining flakiness that I know of, um, but it's slow as hell, never do it. Um, <laughs> you could do it, um, uh, but what you would really have to do to make this effective is sort of like massively parallelize this, and uh, this, is, this would be harder to build. Uh, we did actually do this for a little while at Spotify. It was super helpful in us figuring out uh, what tests were flaky to kind of zero in on where to focus. But we ended up going to the next method, which is sort of the most okay method. Um, 
And uh, so basically what this is, this, this one is way simpler. If you um, run your tests on master, after you merge code to master, um, just record the junit.xml file from that, right? So uh, ingest that into a database. So now every single time that you run your test based on master, um, you're gonna have data for it. So this is a fast method. This is very easy to implement. This isn't gonna like strain your systems or you're not gonna have to like architect huge things for it. Um, but it is not as accurate as the last method. Um, and the reason for that is uh, as tests change, you're basically testing a moving target, right? So uh, keep that in mind. It is still pretty accurate. The way that we do it at Spotify is we basically have a seven day window for determining if a test is flaky. So if, um, if I have a flaky test with this current method here um, and I fix that flaky test straight away, for a couple of days it's still gonna tell me that test is flaky. Um, but it is still a pretty good uh, system. It will warn you if you have flaky tests and so it's serving its purpose quite well for us. And this is the most revolutionary method that I'm aware of, and I have not built this yet. I can't even tell you if it works, but I am so excited about this. So I recently visited Facebook in London for a testing symposium conference. Um, it was probably the most unique conference I've ever been to. I haven't been to many in my life, but uh, it was mostly like uh, academics, PhDs and the like uh, speaking. I had no idea what they were talking about the vast majority of the time, um, but one of the presenters was talking about test flakiness. And sort of like in passing, she mentions uh, this method here, and I've just been fascinated by it ever since. And so let me get, get on, I'm rambling. So what you do basically is you, um, you run a given test three to five times, but before you run it, you instrument your code for code coverage. So um, yeah, turn on code coverage, run your test three to five times, and then you're looking at the difference in code coverage between those test runs, right? What's really cool about this is that this could, this has the potential for telling you that a test might be flaky. It may be like 100% stable today, and it may have always been 100% stable, but if there, are if there are major differences in code coverage, it indicates that the code when you're running your test is going down different code paths each time that you run it. So because it's doing that, that tells you this is not a fully deterministic test, Therefore, it has a high likelihood of being flaky in the future. So this is super cool to me. So if anybody wants to join my team at Spotify to help and build this, we can be best friends. Um, come and talk to me after this. And thank you very much for listening to me. I have stickers. <laughs> <laughs>